I'm just seeing her as this bratty girl who occasionally tells us that she's a master assassin, but like I don't believe her. Hi, my name is Lindy Jung and today we are going to read Throne of Glass by Sarah J Maas and I'm going to sort of analyze it from a writer's point of view, analyze it as a fantasy writer, and try to figure out how this debut led to Sarah J Maas becoming a household name in young adult fantasy. The usual disclaimers apply, this is not a video about Sarah J Maas as a person, more so her career, her body of work, and this specific book. I do not know her personally and I also don't really know anything about her so I'm just not gonna get into the personal side of things. We're just going to read this and figure out what is going on. I do try to approach all of these videos with a hint of sass for comedic effect. They can get a little snarky, a little shady, so if you're not looking for a video that is more of that tone, then that is totally fine, and I'll see you next time. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up because I know that's not everyone's thing. For a little bit of context, I have read this book before years ago. That's why my copy has the old cover where the Selena looks exactly like Sarah J Moss for some reason. So this was her debut. I probably read it when the first couple like uh, Akatar books were coming out, so a really long time ago. I remember not being super impressed with it and not reading any more of the series, but that was a younger me, a different me. We're gonna give this a second chance and I might even read the next couple books of the series because I do own books two and three for some reason. The basic premise is that it follows a young master assassin named Selena Sardothian who ends up entangled in a bunch of court politics. It all starts here and I don't really know what happens in the rest of the series so we're just gonna focus on this one for now. So I am super excited to get into the reading vlog portion of this video but before we do that I wanted to talk very quickly about a brand that has partnered with me today and that is Merit Beauty. So they sent me two of their new matte lipsticks and I have to tell you as someone who is very very picky about makeup formula especially stuff that goes on my lips because I tend to be on the drier side. I love this formula already. It is so lightweight, feels like nothing, it's not super hydrating, but it also isn't very drying, which is amazing for a highly pigmented matte. Right now, I am wearing the shade Classic, and it is the perfect pinky nude on my lips. I was kind of worried because I don't love a pink lipstick, but it's just a touch of pink, so it's like perfect for me right now. They also sent me the shade Power, which I'm super excited to try and show you guys in the cutaway in a bit. You can shop Merit Beauty today using the link in the description box. They have way more than just lipstick, so I highly encourage you to browse. With that link, I do get a little little bit of extra commission at no cost to you. So if you were thinking of buying some new makeup or wanted to check out Merit anyway, then I get helped out a little bit, which I really appreciate. Merit also offers free shipping on all orders above $40. And with your first purchase, they always send you this free adorable little makeup bag that is so minimalist, but so cute. So go ahead and shop Merit through my description box and get your Merit products today. Okay, that is it for the intro. So let's get right into the reading vlog. Hi, it's currently Tuesday, March 12th. So I had originally filmed like a first vlog clip for the Throne of Glass reading vlog. Then for some reason I went to look at it and it had filmed in slow motion. So I sounded like a monster. So we're gonna just do a little quick crisscross applesauce first catch up. I'm around 50 pages in. So far we've obviously met Selena who is the 18 year old former assassin who at the start of the book was enslaved in some salt mines and then she gets yanked out by Dorian Havilliard. Havilliard. Mm. Fantasy names, I love it. Um, he's the prince of the country and he offers her a chance to earn her freedom by competing under his sponsorship in his father, the king's like big tournament to become the next champion, but I'm not 100% sure what a champion is. I'm assuming it's like some sort of political assassin or something like that, but you know what, who knows? It's, um, it's a mystery. Selena agrees to this and they travel to the capital, which is mainly characterized by this huge glass castle, which is probably why this is called Throne of Glass. And yeah, that's where we're at. Nothing else has happened so far. Right off the bat, things I've noticed, and I'm just saying like, you know, the negative things because I'm a writer and I can't not read things with a critical eye. From the beginning, I noticed that the chapters are very short. I kind of like it sometimes because it makes for a really fast paced reading experience, but sometimes the fast pace doesn't work. Like there's a chapter early on where one conversation is split into two chapters and it doesn't make sense. Like there's a cliffhanger mid conversation and then the conversation kind of continues. And I was like, 
that's a choice. Overall, I have to say that like the prose isn't amazing or anything. I'm not gonna pretend that it is. It doesn't have to be. This is a young adult book. It's for a younger audience, so it doesn't necessarily need to read like highbrow literary fiction, but the prose is really readable. It's relatively descriptive. Okay, this book feels polished. I don't even know quite what I mean when I say that, but maybe it's because a lot of the YA I've been reading has been in the form of ARCs or advanced reader copies. I mean, just the number of typos and then the flow of the prose, the voice, um, repetitive wording, that's one that I noticed a lot. I was really shocked and I wasn't sure if it was because it was ARCs that hadn't gone through their final round of copy edits. I mean, they probably should have or if it was something else but I feel like this book which came out in 2012 kind of has like a higher level of prose than I have been seeing in a lot of young adult fantasy recently. I have heard that especially in her most recent book which I think was probably like a Crescent City book, Sarah J Maas's books have really dropped off in terms of the prose quality so it'll be interesting to see that evolution but you can really tell this was well edited which is nice. Other things I've noticed, I actually want to talk about Selena's character that might be the angle I go for with this book. She's definitely got a touch of that like you know early 2000s early 2010s not like other girl why a fantasy girl protagonist syndrome which is fine you know it's par for the course we're used to it we've grown and evolved since then this is an older book what i do find interesting about her is that she's like really feminine she's kind of vain i'll point this out now i've been tabbing these tabs are for mentions of character attractiveness not just selena just like anyone is mentioned explicitly as being like hot or beautiful or whatever and this is just like the greenish ones are cringy inner monologue but the beige ones are characters being explicitly described as hot so there's a lot of focus on appearance in all of the characters and a lot of the characters are just characterized by how hot they are or how much they get laid in the case of dorian apparently this is third person it does switch to some of the other characters sometimes in terms of perspective but you do stay very rooted in selena and so here's my concluding thought she's a very vain and superficial person i am not opposed to vain and superficial female characters i wrote a vain and superficial female character i kind of you know i I think it's a mood. But she also reads as very childish in her vanity and she reads as a little bit bratty sometimes. Again, not an issue, but she's supposed to be like a master assassin. I think that's where I'm having a little bit of an issue where someone who's supposed to be so good at a job where they are not supposed to be noticed. To me, I'm almost like, oh, if this had been slightly more removed from Selena's point of view, would that facade of brattiness have worked better and worked with this sort of twist that she's like an assassin underneath that. Instead, we are very rooted in her point of view, so we see that she's very much like that all the way down to the core. She's kind of a shallow, vain, appearance-focused person. Which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just having a hard time like merging those two ideas, like master assassin and also 18-year-old girl who's very focused on her appearance and how hot other people are on top of that. I'm interested to see how that develops. Of course, when a character starts out with so many glaring flaws or a really big glaring flaw in this case, that gives them a lot of room to have a really good character arc. I try to like withhold judgment on that. I think it's just that sort of like dichotomy that's getting to me right now. Like it doesn't fully make sense. Also because we haven't seen her do any badass assassin stuff. So I'm just seeing her as this bratty girl who occasionally tells us that she's a master assassin, but like I don't believe her. So that is where I'm at right now. I'm gonna keep reading. I do wanna finish reading this book in the next couple days. I'm zipping through it. I just am so busy with other things right now. We're gonna keep reading this book this one and I'll catch you guys up again in a little bit maybe like at the midpoint or when something happens I don't know bye hi it's March 13th I just finished filming the moths recap video which is why I have moth eyeliner and moth earrings just whole moth theme full out but that's not why we're here right now oh my god i am well over halfway through throne of glass it's actually been such a breeze to read i guess these like i don't want to say trashy that sounds mean but these like very consumable commercial young adult books are meant to be very digestible and i kind of like that it's kind of refreshing to not use my brain so much but as you can see the hotness tabs have only grown i've actually run out of the colors i was using so we're not gonna tab hotness anymore but it happens a lot everyone is hot and it has to be mentioned all the time the other thing that i've started to tab here 
is yeah just like cringy inner monologue so let's let's backtrack we have selena i honestly can't help but like her i just like her a younger version of me would have detested her but you know what i've matured as a person as a woman and she is fun and funny can't help but like her even though she's a little bit grating sometimes so are most of the women i know let women be annoying and likable at the same time the character i don't like is dorian i tend to not like privileged characters who are also like low-key misogynistic. Why does he keep going in her room and staring at her? And they played like pool at one point, which why are they playing pool? And he like did the arms around and show her how to play pool thing. Don't like that. He weirds me out. I don't like Dorian. I Kale is okay. He's boring. I don't like any of the men. I love Nehemia. I feel like Nehemia? Nehemia? Um, I feel like she's destined for death because she is a woman of color. I also already knew that she's gonna die, but I like her. Oh my god. She's so sassy and fun. I like that there's a female friendship here. What else is there to say? One of the things that I got bored and I started to do a deep dive on was how this book started out on fictionpress.net. It's like fanfiction.net or AO3, but for original works. Fiction Press was one. There was another one called Storywrite that I was on, actually. I wrote my stories on there starting from when I was like nine years old, which is too young to be on the internet, in my opinion. But you could post your original work on there and people could read it and engage with it. Apparently this was like the biggest story on Fiction Press for such a long time. It was called Queen of Class in its original form and I found a PDF of it. Y'all, it's not very good, but I think she was like 16 when she started writing it there. So of course it's not very good, she was 16. I'm slightly too old for Wattpad, but that means that this was probably like the first or the ancestral Wattpad novel. All of the after girlies, all of the, I don't actually know any other, but all the Wattpad novel girlies have this lady to thank. I lost my train of thought. And I feel like that's so interesting because her career, Sarah J Moss's career has so exploded beyond that, that no one even talks about that aspect anymore. Like she is not just a Wattpad slash fictionpress.com author. She is one of the best-selling fantasy authors of all time, which is honestly good for her. Like, I wish that were me, but I want to dig more into that. I want to figure out like, how did she get picked up? Was she signed off the basis of the story being so popular on Fiction Press? It seems like it went through a shit ton of editing because the version of Queen of Glass that I read, which I only could handle like a page, was pretty bad, is not anywhere near as like polished or as readable as this. The voice is a lot less mature. The writing is kind of stilted. I can see elements of it here. There are definitely scenes that are like, why is this necessary? What is happening? And the dialogue feels stilted. And I'm like, this scene was not edited for whatever reason. Clearly it underwent a lot of work to become Throne of Glass. And I'm wondering if she pulled it because it's not on Fiction Press anymore. Obviously, I don't even know if Fiction Press still exists. Well, she pulled Queen of Glass, yoinked it right off of that website. And then this came out sometime later. So did she polish it up and then query it or did an agent reach out to her? Like, how did that work? I do believe that the version of this Queen of Glass is significantly different enough to not warrant any like first publication contract violations. It is very different, but it's still like the same character names, the same place names. It starts out in the salt mines, the same basic plot, I'd assume. So I'm just wondering what happened there. But if you guys know the tea, then please tell me because I'm very interested in how books like this happen. But that is my update. So I will see you all. I just can't stop looking, it's so fun. I have been accused of being fake Korean, as in like pretending I'm Korean. I've never been accused of faking ADHD because I think it's very obvious. I'm gonna keep reading this. I'm having a good time with it, honestly. It's not that I have no notes. I am still confused on how it became such a breakout hit because it does feel a little bit like a par for the chorus generic, you know, young adult fantasy novel, but I'm having a good time with it. I kind of want to see what happens next. That's it. I'll update you guys in a little bit. Bye. Shall I compare to a summer day? She's the sun, she fill out the gray. Quench my thirst, she's my lemonade. You know that I couldn't paint. Shall I compare to a summer day? Just like the sun. So, now that I have officially read Throne of Glass for the second time ever in my life, I really do not hate this at all. And I'm 
kind of shocked. Like, I do these videos with books that I specifically do not have a very high opinion of going into, and I remember not liking this book. At this point in my life, young adult fantasy, especially like soapy, romanticy leaning young adult fantasy, is not my thing at all. I've just grown to prefer books that have a lot more like world building and depth to them than young adult fantasy typically does, but you cannot deny that this is very, very readable. It's an entertaining, light read with a quick pace, it keeps you hooked, so it accomplishes pretty much everything it sets out to do. As I was doing research for the discussion part of this video, I did find an article that called Sergei Moss's books candy, like the literature equivalent of candy. They're bite-sized and sugary and a little bit addictive. I feel like that's super apt. I will link that article in the description box as well. Like this book has solid stakes. The characters do fall a little bit flat for me, but I ended up ultimately liking the main character enough to carry through her little quirks and annoyances. I guess this book also caught me in the right mood because I've been reading and consuming heavier media lately, so something that was a little lighter and soapy and indulgent kind of hit the spot. But of course I do have my complaints, I'll get to those in just a second, but I want to give you guys a somewhat thorough summary of the series of events first. Spoilers ahead from here on out, let's get into it. So we open up the book with Selena Sardothian. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I might pronounce it a little bit different every time. I kind of wish there were a pronunciation guide in the back because some of these names are ridiculous. So Selena is a slave in some salt mines. She was arrested for being an assassin, but she's not just any assassin. She's the assassin, like best assassin in the world, apparently, despite only being 18 years old. So in the beginning, she's brought to meet Dorian, the Prince of Adderlon. Adderlon is a conquering nation, so it has colonized a bunch of its neighboring countries, including the country where Selene is from, Terrasen. So Dorian's father is basically an evil emperor. Standard, stock, evil king stuff. Selena hates him, and so she also hates Dorian by extension, but he's actually come here to offer her an opportunity to win her freedom in this somewhat convoluted scenario where she would basically be his nominee to enter this like testing period to determine the next champion of the king. The champion of the king is, I think, some combination of like personal assassin and spy. So she'd be doing Doing the king's dirty work, which obviously she doesn't agree with that, but if she does his dirty work for four years as his champion, then she can have her freedom. It's established pretty quickly that the salt mines are a bad place to be, and it's a miracle that she's even survived in them for as long as she has. So Selena agrees to the deal. Somewhere around here, we also meet Kaol, the captain of the guard. So now we have all the love triangle members. They all journey to the big glass castle where the royal family lives. Selena turns out to not be what anyone really expected. She's kind of just a girl. She just kind of wants to eat and dress up and look pretty. The competition to choose the next champion begins, and Selena's main threat is a man named Kane. He is characterized as being big and mean and strong. He's competing on behalf of Duke Parrington, also characterized in a very one-note way where he's just the typical weaselly conniving politician. Parrington is maybe engaged to this young woman named Caltaine who's around Selena's age, and Caltaine just hates Selena, hates how much attention Dorian gives her, very jealous, but also she's very much a victim of Parrington. Selena also hates Caltaine, which kind of makes you think that she is not a girl's girl. But then we meet Nehemia, who is the visiting princess of Elwe, one of the conquered lands, and she's just super cool and she and Selena hit it off. She doesn't speak much of the language of Adderlin, so Selena, who speaks a little bit of the Elway language, translates for her. I really like this. I like their friendship. I think it was very believable and like wholesome and cute. It's one of the stronger emotional threads in the book. So somewhere along the way with this competition going on, the other competitors start turning up murdered, but not like regular murdered, like grisly murdered. The parts of the book that describe what happens to the bodies are the most graphic and gory, uh, which I don't mind, but I just think that's kind of funny. Selena's like navigating this. She's trying to stay safe safe, she's starting to get paranoid, she finds a tunnel in her rooms that leads to this underground crypt where she meets the dead fairy queen. The dead fairy queen's name is Elena. Unfortunately, Selena starts to suspect Nehemia of killing the competitors to get back at the king, which doesn't fully make sense. Somewhere in here there's a masked ball, because of course there is, and Selena flirts with Kale and Dorian, and both of them fall in love with her because of course they do. Selena and Dorian kind of start to date. They, you know, they haven't defined the relationship, but they're definitely like 
making out and stuff. Toward the end, Selena has an encounter with Kane. He summons a demon on her, locks her in with the demon. She manages to escape, but she doesn't tell anyone that Kane is the one summoning demons that are killing other competitors. She just goes straight to the final trial where she has to fight him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Kane almost smushes her, but Elena and her ghost with a little aid from Nehemia comes down and helps take away some of Kane's ungodly, unearthly demonic power. And Selena manages to beat him and become the champion. Obviously this comes with some internal conflict, which I think is really interesting actually, because yes, this is her ticket to freedom, but how far is she going to go? She breaks up with Dorian kind of because of this and then leaves things more open-ended with Kale. And that is basically the plot of Throne of Glass. It's not super complicated. Now on to my petty complaints. So number one, which isn't really a complaint as much as it is an observation, is that the basic structure of this book is really familiar. And then once you move past the basic structure being really familiar, you'll see that a lot of it is really familiar if you've read basically any secondary world epic fantasy that harkens back to Lord of the Rings. The familiarity means that the mystery elements tend to fall flat. Like of course Selina finds out that she's related to Elena the Fairy Queen who appears only to her and kind of shares part of her name. And of course Kane's the bad guy. His name is literally Kane and he is evil. This is very much a book that wears its Lord of the Rings inspiration on its sleeve very proudly. I believe Sarah J Maas has also directly said that Lord of the Rings is one of her favorite book series, which makes sense, you know, it's a very seminal work for a lot of fantasy. This is not the first fantasy book to pull directly from Lord of the Rings. I think more of the issue that I see and more of the reason that I personally did not like this book the first time around is that it borrows all these tropes, it pulls them, but it's not really interested in exploring these tropes past the surface level, which is one of my main gripes with a lot of young adult fantasy that tends to feel derivative. There's nothing wrong with being derivative, with finding inspiration from other works, other tropes. I feel like all stories inherently sort of build off what has come before them, but I do think it's kind of like a book that feels very shallow, which is also part of why it is so easy to read. It is so readable, it is so appealing to such a broad audience because you don't really have to think about it. So yeah, like its main character who we specifically see is very vain and obsessed with her appearance and others' appearances, this is a really shallow book. Everyone is attractive, everyone is either good or bad, the tropes are just tropes there for your satisfaction, and pretty serious themes and issues like colonization and tyrannical leadership those are kind of just shoved to the side or used as plot points rather than being explored. Take that with a grain of salt, this is young adult fantasy, it is inherently geared toward a younger audience, and that means that there's probably not going to be as much room to explore those topics in the depth that an adult fantasy book might, but it is just a shallow surface level book. Now that we've covered that, I want to talk a little bit about Sarah J Maas's career starting with this debut. So here's what we know. Sarah J Maas was 16 when she first wrote Queen of Glass, which which was the precursor to Throne of Glass. I read part of it, it's not very good. This version of the book went onto fictionpress.net in the early aughts, and it was a very popular story on that website. 10 years later, in 2012, she published Throne of Glass with Bloomsbury. Initially, this book just kind of did okay. It sold, but it wasn't a bestseller. It wasn't until the sequel, Crown of Midnight, came out that Sarah J Maas actually hit the bestseller lists, and that was obviously just the beginning. So I have a theory on how this book and specifically this book series, which I think is like eight books, took off in the way that it did. So it's honestly kind of difficult to imagine this, but back in 2012, young adult secondary world and epic fantasy was not really a thing. So by that, I mean a book like this, where it's very much a secondary world with its own world building politics, usually like more of a medieval type of setting versus the more popular fantasy genres at the time, which were urban fantasy and paranormal romance. I'm not saying that secondary world young adult fantasy didn't exist. I'm just saying it was not nearly as big as like the Shadowhunter books, Vampire Academy books, all of those paranormal books were just so much bigger. They were definitely king for so long. But around 2012 was when that was starting to peter off a little bit. There was an oversaturation, people were getting tired of the Twilight-y, soapy, teenage high school romance type books. When Throne of Glass came out, it was kind of refreshing. I know that sounds so weird given how many imitators we've seen of this book, of this style, of this type we've seen since, but it was relatively fresh. It was treading new ground. It was kind of like a right place, right time moment. Like it was familiar enough with the love triangles, the soapy teen romance, the drama, the magic, that people who are very familiar with urban fantasy and paranormal would able to like make that transition pretty well. But it was a new setting. There was more politics. It just kind of was different. It was a shift, but not too much of a shift. And since then, I feel like 
like Sarah J Moss has gone on to kick off two more publishing trends. So romanticy as a whole, which we're seeing more and more lately, and also the fairy court romance fantasy, which was big for a little while. And like I said before, these books are like candy. They're not complex. They're very approachable for a broad range of readers. They were familiar without being too familiar. So I know I normally have a lesson or a takeaway from these videos, but honestly, in this case, I don't think that Sarah J Maas's commercial success can be perfectly replicated. I know a lot of people have tried, some have succeeded in their own way. I truly think that given her career longevity and how consistently she sells, I don't think any of the people who have tried to do exactly what she has done are going to see that same level of long-term success. Say what you will about the quality of her work, she has broad mass appeal and she was able to, either intentionally or not, hit on these very specific trends multiple times. She's played a heavy role in redefining finding young adult fantasy and romanticy and millions of people everywhere do love her books and I can see why. So I guess if I do have a lesson to impart upon you today, it's that given what we've seen with Sarah J Maas starting out on the internet, writing what she likes and then going on to publish the book that she wrote as a teenager 10 years later, maybe it's not about trying to follow the trends or predict the market. Maybe it's just about writing something that calls to you that you want to write or wanted to see as a 16 year old and try to publish that and maybe it will strike a chord with the right people. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.